Yes. But I was just going to do that. Thank you, Kale. So welcome everyone to China is not our enemy. Um, another episode with um, our amazing guest. First, I want to just talk a little bit about the campaign. Um, as I was setting it up, is like here we watch. We watched with the war in Iraq. We watched with Vietnam. We watched with Korea. That the first casualty in war is the truth, and those lies are what drive us to war. And so we saw smoke. Um, I say smoke. You know, when we start watching lies dr driven towards China, lies that make people hate. What a horrible thing to to tell a lie to make people hate. When we really, as people on this planet, need to love and care for each other, we need to be in cooperation, especially when we have a planet that's suffering so much. It's like love is what we need right now. So we launched the campaign, China is not our enemy, because we wanted to get in the way of the propaganda, as I call it, the smoke, before it turned into a fire, before it turned into a war, because the war on terror, the, the lies that drove us to war in Iraq, cost US taxpayers $20 trillion of taxpayer money to murder 6 million innocent people in the Middle East. And I say innocent because there wasn't anyone in the Middle East that did anything. We invaded an innocent country and killed innocent people that has spread across the Middle East, Middle East and that's 6 million people dead. Now, as we watch these horrors in Palestine, I want you to understand it's like 20,000 probably dead already. Horrible, horrible that we have watched this. This is a crime against humanity. But just think about 6 million dead from the US war on terror. That was 25,000 people on average per month. So what we are watching is like we haven't stopped the violence of the empire. We haven't stopped creating more weapons. If we watch right now, what we must do is all stand together and all say, no, not in my name, not with my money. This violence is horrendous and it must stop. So we're here together to create that peace to um, across, uh, across the ocean, across the Pacific ocean with our dear guest today, Jing Jing. She has been a journalist for more than 10 years, traveling across China and reporting on poverty alleviation, ethnic diversity in Xinjiang um, and Tibet. Um, she's also traveled around the world to explore what the Belt and Road Initiative looks like outside of China. Well, she recently came to the United States to cover the Chi Biden Summit in San Francisco during which she was able to interview a lot of other people here. And I got to see her before she flew back to China. I was flying in from China, she was flying back to China. And I just thought what she had seen and heard, I wanted to share with all of you. At CGTN, she hosts Talk It Out with Li Jingjing and JJ on the Road. You can catch these on YouTube and her Twitter at jingjing underscore Li. Don't miss them. Because the one thing that um, I just love about this adorable woman is that she has a commitment, just like those at Code Pink. She wants to build bridges between the peoples for peace. So she travels and she brings to her, her audience once she what she learns, not only what she learns, but the voices of those in the region she's visiting. She reaches out to experts to learn more and raises their voices and shares them with her audience. I see her work debunking the lies and it makes me cry with joy. We're sisters in peace and love. Jing Jing says, when we know each other, the narratives won't work anymore, which is what we believe at Code Pink, which is why we travel around the world and why we bring people with us too. So Jing Jing, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning in Beijing. I just want to say to everyone, she's 16 hours ahead of us, <laughs> our tomorrow morning. Um, it was so lovely to see you on your recent visit to the US. Can you uh, tell the audience like why you came to the US and maybe some of your first impressions when you arrived in San Francisco? 
Thank you, Jody, for your kind introduction. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me. It's 9 a.m. in Beijing. Greetings from Beijing. And I, I already saw some friends that I met in San Francisco in this group already, KJ. <laughs> I'm just very happy to see you again online. So um, I went to the United States during the APEC meeting. Uh, I was among one of the reporters from CGTN and from Ho China that went to San Francisco to cover the APEC meeting and also the meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and also US President Joe Biden. So um, it, this time I went to the United States for work, but before also before COVID, I traveled to the US for just for tourism before uh, in, San, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and also New York. So I also wondered, how many things changed during the past few years. So I was very excited to go to the United States this time to meet all of you, my friends, and also just to see on the ground, because we know when you hear some stories from media, it not necessarily represents everybody. So I'm very keen to know how the public, American public feel about China. Does everybody look like China as an enemy? So I just want to do my own research as well. So my impressions about the United States, uh, first I have, I have to say, the United States is really beautiful. Beautiful. It's a great country. And San Francisco is really beautiful. And it'll be super comfortable to live there if you are rich. Um, so I understand why there are a lot of people when they go to the United States, they were like fascinated by everything. It is fascinating, but what's shocking me is the stark contrast of the rich and poor, uh, because we were very fortunate to live in downtown San Francisco, uh, where everybody told us don't live there. <laughs> there are a lot of danger. There are a lot of, um, uh, uh like overdose people with uh, they, they may rob you so we were told to not stay there well uh we were lucky to just to stay there and we were arrived a few days earlier ahead of APEC meeting before they clear out all the homeless people so we saw the the the, the un another side of San Francisco and you know San Francisco Many parts of the city is so pretty, like scenic spots, like the beautiful houses, the, the, the area where rich people live. And we also went to a fancy restaurant. It's so uh, fantastic. But then how come the downtown area can be, uh, I don't, I, I lack of the, the words to describe the region. For example, the, how can the sidewalks become public bathroom? And how come there are whole, so many hopeless, uh, homeless people and hopeless people on the streets and or like drug overdose people? I mean, I'm not trying to put down on the United States, but that scene, uh, even I come from China, a developing nation, I would never see, I have never seen such, such scene in Ch any city of China. Even if I go to the most remote, poorest region in China, I wouldn't see that. And I've been to some of the world's uh, least developing nations um, in the world. They were impoverished people, but they are not as hopeless as those homeless people I saw on the street in San Francisco. So I think the first impression uh, to me is the stark contrast of the rich and the poor in the United States. Um, but... Uh, and also, I think the second, second, um, my experience, I found is shocking that people, because there are people know China, like you guys, uh, like those who have long time relationship doing business, doing cultural cooperations with China, but that probably 5% of the American population it's a very small group of people that really are friendly and knows China very well, or, or whether they know if they're friendly to China or not, they know what China is like, the history, the politics. So I want to ask people outside of that circle, what the general public feel and know about China. And to my surprise, most people know absolutely nothing about China. Even if 
they can bring up some of the lighthearted things like kung fu or noodles. I, I can live with that. But most of the people, especially young people I approach, they when I ask them what's the first thing pops up in your mind when thinking about China, there are no answers. They seriously know nothing about China. Now, I'm not saying everybody should know China. I'm not that arrogant. It's just because if I do this research in China, if I ask college students or people on the streets, what's the first thing pops up in your mind when talking about the United States? How do you feel about the United States? I'm sure everybody can give a pretty good answer. Some will say freedom, diversity is a great country or some TV dramas like Friends uh, or Starbucks uh, because most people, uh, they already know America through learning the language, through learning the culture, through reading news. And and if they read the politics, they will know even better. So I'm just shocked how, and if I do this research in other developing nations like Africa or Latin America, I'm sure people will give good answers to China and the United States very well. Because I I found people in China or other developing nations, they have very good sense of the well about a good sense of knowledge about the world, about world politics, about what's going on in the world, what's what the current affairs, of different countries' cultures. So it's a little bit shocking to me that people absolutely know nothing. And there are some students give some um words the to describe China. But I also find it interesting whether Chinese students or American students, when they talk about the United States, they will give positive words to describe United States, such as diversity, such as freedom. And all the students, when they describe China, they will use words like COVID, competition. Well, and there are some words they they probably too shy to bring it to my face, but uh, they just they always tend to use very negative words to describe China. So it's shocking how come there's a huge gap of knowledge about each other's countries. So that's why I think it's so important that we all have a people to people connections. More Chinese people travel to the United States, study in the United States, even though now it's still already a large number of Chinese people traveling, living, studying in the United States. But we also need more people from the United States to come to China, either for travel, either for studying, either just just, just sightseeing, uh, come here, interact with the people because the people to people connection is the key to, to build a bridge, to build a basic understandings. When we know each other person to person, uh, when you when this country, this race of people is is not like stranger to you, there there will be no space for fear. So that's why I think uh, what Chinese President Xi Jinping said this time, I, I totally agree, is the we need more people to people connections and the future between the, the future of China's US relationship lies in the people, uh, lies in the youth. And I'm so happy that he's inviting uh, 50,000 young people in America to study in China in the next five years. So I think that will be a good start for a better relationship between China and the US. I totally agree with you. Um, I could think it's all about, you know, the people to people. So if we were to come, and China is a very big country, um, what are your favorite places? Uh, you know, we have many members of China's Not Our Enemy. And one of the really sad things is that inside the United States, it's almost like you're not allowed to love China because, oh my God, if you love China, then you work for the CCP. You know, it's just like <laughs> it's just very McCarthyist. You know, you're you're not allowed to have your true feelings. Uh, you know, kind of like with Palestine, you're not allowed to like love Palestine and and say no genocide. So. Um, we we know like you know Chinese Americans is it you know I saw in your interviews where mm -hmm. you're interviewing Chinese Americans and they're witnessing the president of their two countries come together their culture and their place where they live so yeah. um, 
share with us some of your favorite places because you travel all over the country. What should we not miss? What are your favorite things about China? Wow. Uh, there are so many places, you know, like just like the United States, China is huge and wide and each province is different from another province. So I cannot pick one favorite place because I feel there's different places are so... Okay, so how about we start from the uh, Southwest? Because I think when you come to China, you definitely should come to Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou and Hong Kong, this uh, first tier cities, metropolitans, but you won't see the other side of China. Um, because the rest of China is nothing like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou. And so I would recommend go to Northwest and East to West and uh, Southwest. It's more inner land and also with the different uh, ethnic groups uh, living there. For example, how about we start with the uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Tibet, and also Yunnan, uh, Guangxi. Uh, Yunnan, Guangxi is in the southwest of China. So those regions also um, probably around 30 or 40 ethnic groups live there, but you already hear from them because, you know, like probably the CIA don't see there's a, there would those regions invested uh, worth investing because they don't see any problems in this region to 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 drive a wedge between different uh, ethnic groups in China. But I would recommend go to Yunnan and Guangxi in southwest China because the majority of ethnic groups live there are Guangxi, Zhuangzu, uh, Miaozu. So when you go there, you will realize. The Chinese culture is not just this kind of culture, the, the stereotype Chinese image. It's um it's Chinese culture is very diverse. China Chinese culture is the uh combination of 56 different ethnic groups. And there the population of ethnic minorities actually outnumbered Han Chinese. And they all have their own holidays, their own languages, their own ways of celebrating different cultures. So you will see other side of China. But I think also worth, you know, I loved, um, I got deeper understanding about my own country, my own culture is exactly because I traveled to different parts of China. Um, when you go to these regions, you realize how difficult poverty alleviation project was to any governments. I can give you a few examples. Um, each province has a different geopolitical, uh, ge not, geography, sorry, uh, geography conditions. And the reasons that led to those regions into poverty is also different. In Guangxi, Guangxi is um, just like Xinjiang, it's nature blessed province. It has everything, has wonderful trees, had a wonderful agricultural products, but Guangxi is geo, like I would say, how to say, um, isolated from the rest of the province because it has steep mountains. And most of the tribes couldn't leave their regions just because of there were no roads. There, it was almost impossible to build bridges and roads in such a, a steep mountains. But nowadays, when you go to Guangxi, everybody can get out and the roads have built right into each household. Not just roads linking different villages, different cities. The roads are built into the mountains, into the village and into each household. So the farmers can bring their fruits, their tender rings uh, from their backyard to the to the street and let different companies to to transport those products to the rest of China. It made their life, their business much easier. So that's one thing that got helped them got out of poverty. And I also recommend people go to Tibet, Xizang in Mandarin. Because when I go there, I realize, oh my God, how could anybody build anything there? The the Tibet is the lowest point is 4,000 meters above sea level. 
and the rest of the part, you know, it probably 6,000. So it's very high. So the low oxygen is a, is a major problem for everything. So in that condition, it's almost impossible for anyone, anyone to work for a long time. But they build railways and high, highways. You know, in, in, in Tibet, in the winter, it's super freezing. No one could work in the winter time. So only uh, four or five months that humans can work, uh, do high labor work. It's during the summer, like for, for example, from four, uh, April to, to, to July. Only those few months you can work for a long time. But then you, you have to rest uh, constantly because of the low oxygen and high altitude. But even with the, and the majority of the land of the earth in Tibet, in the winter, it's frozen earth. Means I, during nighttime, it's, it's, it's frozen. But in the nighttime, it becomes mud. So it poses great challenges for anyone who wants to do constructions, to build any foundations for railways, for highways. So when you see that, and you see the magnificent roads and highways, I got to wonder how did like those workers build those railways? So when you go to those regions, you actually understand, see what it is like and understand uh, how, how difficult it was to, for the government to come out with a very specific uh, poverty, poverty alleviation policies that, that suits each province because China, here we use the targeted poverty alleviation policies, means each household, each city, each, each, each province has a different policy because their conditions are different. So you, there's no one size fits all uh, project that can help everyone. So the government workers go to those places to investigate what's the reason that led to this region into poverty. Is that because of roads? Is that because of the uh, uh, climate? Is that because of uh, maybe this household just uh, unfortunate that many family members experience natural disasters uh, and uh, the high cost of, of uh, hospital uh, treating them in hospital is the major reason that led this household went into poverty. So they have very specific plans in each province. And when you go to the province and you see that, um, it helped me to realize and uh, have a deeper admiration for all those CPC staffs, uh, it, it, caught, it requires a huge dedication uh, of serving the people to come out with such a plan. So I really recommend everybody to go to this region to see for yourself and you realize how much it changes it has brought, uh, that the country has, has made it like to itself in the past four decades. So, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. I thought it went away. Um, so then what, um, you, you talked about the culture and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we find out in the U.S. that, um, we're, we're told in the U.S. that China wants to go to war on the United States. I wonder if you could comment about that. The last thing Chinese want is war. I can assure you, I can assure anyone who thinks China wants to go to war, China is not interested in war at all. Uh, what China, Chinese people or Chinese government want is just develop. We want to develop, we don't want to do business, we want to get rich, we want to have a better life. Uh, I say that because for one, this country experienced so many wars on this land. So even though the young generations don't know, haven't experienced the wars themselves, but they know from their parents, their grandparents, from our history books, what this country went through. No one wants war. And, you know, I think um, especially now when Chinese people see what's happening um, between Israel and uh, Gaza. First, Chinese people know both sides of the story and they understand what the, 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 they've been through. The first thing comes to their mind if you go to social network to see Chinese netizens' comments. 
everybody is saying it just reminds them of the war uh the when japanese invaders came to china and it just reminds of reminds them of that how er, how the young children how the chinese people chinese women were being slaughtered by the imperial japanese soldiers so and also syria went through war and when syrian president came to china all the netizens saying you know, we all sure the the roses of Damascus will bloom again. And we used to be under the rain. So we want to give others umbrellas now. And those comments, those are not just one or two. It's like massive amount of comments uh, during Syrian presence was here, during uh, this Israel-Palestine conflicts. Chinese people sympathize them because they experienced the war. And they're seeing other people going through the similar experiences. They don't want to see that happen again. And also, the last thing Chinese want is instability. Because instability with instability, you cannot develop. There's no economic growth. So I think this time when Chinese president and the U.S. president met, um, my takeaway, okay, my takeaway is... Um, at least first, both sides want to agree to stabilize their relations. And uh, and I think both sides realize for a long time, the, con the relationship between China and the U.S. probably will be negative. They are not blindly, naively believe it will be all nice and uh, BFF forever. But for the long time, it'll be negative, but they have to learn how to coexist. I think both sides through the past few years of tech wars and uh, and trade wars, both sides realize decoupling and military conflicts is no one wanted. Both sides doesn't want it. And also I think through the years, both, both sides realize um, the limitations of the US sanctions on China. Uh, China's economy and uh, is quite resilient. Doesn't mean China doesn't suffer uh, harms from the U.S. sanctions and the trade wars and chip wars, but it cannot destroy China immediately. But also, uh, China doesn't want to see this damage. So both sides, I think, want to just agree. Okay, we cannot change each other. And we, but we also cannot afford decoupling and uh, uh, have military conflict with each other. So let's just just have a ceasefire, just learn how to coexist. And if you read Chinese government's comments, the message is always just let us develop. Let us have the right and the space to develop and we don't want war. So I think that's the major takeaways. I'm sure Chinese, no one want from China want to work with China. China's message is just to develop, is to achieve its next centenary goal. It's to build China into a modern socialist country where everyone can have a much better life. That's a simple goal. So, um, yeah, that's a simple goal. <laughs> <laughs> Make, uh, that I think, you know, every person in the world would like to be able to live their lives. And um, so, you know, you've also traveled um, not just to the United States and around China, but you've also traveled around the world to some of the Belt and Road uh, countries. And I wondered, you know, if you could share with us what you've learned as you've gone to see what does the Belt and Road Initiative look like in Africa and some of the other places you've been? You tell us about your adventures. Well, um, where to start? Let me think. So I really think the Belt and Road Initiative is something that will change the world, world order completely. Doesn't mean one country defeat another. It's a project that will eventually give the majority of the world a right to develop it will finally allow the developing nations, the global South, to have the right to have infrastructures to develop that they have been denied for centuries during the Western 
uh, imperialism. So when you go to Africa, well, if you only read Western mainstream media, you think what China doing in Africa is horrible. But if you go to Africa and talk to African people, they have a completely different view. They will say the completely different things. Doesn't mean there's no problems among like the different Chinese companies or with the local companies. They have they will have compl- conflicts, but it's not what the Western media described as the new colonialism. Um, and the first thing is, as a Chinese, when I go to those regions, everybody treated me so well. They treated me as family. They welcomed me. For example, I went to Tanzania. Uh, the local people. When they will ask you, where are you from? Are you Chinese? When I told them I'm Chinese, they were, they, the first thing they say, oh, Chairman Mao, we love Chairman Mao, you're Chinese. So they showed so much appreciation, a welcome, a hospitality to me when they found out I'm Chinese. Well, and why this show me such a great time? Not because I'm uh, some, like, some fancy person or a diva or whatever, not because of me. It's because of the other Chinese companies, factories, and the engineers uh, there have built the reputation for Chinese people because they saw the difference between Chinese investors and uh, the Western investors. Um, when Chinese investor came, they brought ports, water system, um, roads, railways, and improved their living standards. So that's why they like Chinese people. And uh, also speaking of Tanzania, uh, Tanzania is the starting place of, I would say, Belt and Road Initiative or China's foreign aid uh, program because the the first railway that China built in Africa is the railway called Tazara Railway. It's the railway that linked Zambia and Tanzania. And, oh, and that was built in the 1970s, uh, initiated by Chinese Chairman Mao and also uh, Zambia's, uh, I forgot his full name, Kawinda and uh, Tanzania's Nerere. So these three president, chairman, talk it out and uh, build this railway. And, you know, during that time, Tanzania and Zambia also went for help, when asking for help from the United Kingdom, from the United States, from Soviet Union. They asked all those great powers back then, but no one came because they even refused to send researchers to do underground research because they found it cost so much money and uh, with little payback. So they don't think it's worth investing. And so those countries came to China for help and China provided all, all rounds of help like um, investigation, exploration, design, construction, and interest-free loans in the 1970s. And it's kind of like what is happening now. When you ask those developing nations uh, why, they re- re- why they accept China's investments, and a Western, like United States, they keep uh, demonizing China's investment. It's so horrible. Don't trust China. Don't work with China. But, but why didn't you help them? They went to you, went to you to ask for help, but you refused because you don't think it bring enough benefits for you. You you don't think it's worth investing. So China was the only country that provided help. I got the same answer in Pakistan. I, went, I got the same answer in Greece. I got the same answer in Tanzania. Every country I go, I ask them, how do you think China's assistance? They thought China was the only country that came to help us when we were desperate. Pakistan was the same when the, Pakistan was experiencing this uh, huge debt crisis. Uh, that's how the CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor was built. China was the only country to help. Greece was the same. Um, many European countries are upset that China is, is the main, uh, the, uh, it controls the port, Paris port, because uh, China's company bought it. They are unhappy with it. But when Greece was went through debt crisis, no country went to help. So China's company, Costco, was the only country that, that invested in it. So, and then uh, that's that. But then you see also the difference because when you go to see those those 
uh, Chinese or when well, some Chinese, it's like Belt and Road projects. Some just think China controls all of that. But when you go to those companies, you see the employees, you see how it worked. The actually it's the locals that controls this company. For example, in in the I went to a coal plant in Pakistan. In the coal plant, how are they helping the local people to be able to run uh, energy plants? When the company first went to Pakistan, they found out uh, many staff didn't have enough trainings and knowledge of running a huge plant. So at the initial stage, it's probably mainly Chinese uh, in, uh, engineers and uh, to, to help that. But during that time, they also brought hundreds of Pakistani employees, engineers to China to be trained. And now several years later, those who ex received the trainings have become have received senior positions in this power plant. They've been promoted as a leader in the company. So gradually they are giving those key positions to the locals once they were uh, got enough training. And this coal plant itself created so many hundreds of thousands of jobs. And when you have a company that creates jobs and generated electricity for the for the village, all the nearby villages has less crimes. We went to the nearby villages, ask how the villagers feel about this plant near you. Is there any pollution to 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 your river, to your farmland? They all said no. And you know what? Just because of there's a plant and all of the men in the village working the plant, and there's no crimes anymore. So I think that's the fundamental difference between uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, Western imperialism is through economic development. You can forever have peace and stability. And that's the thing many regions wanted. Um, in, the, in the Middle East, West Asia, uh, in Africa, Latin America, Caribbeans, they went through so many wars, exploitations, they never have the rights to to, to, to develop. But this, this Belt and Road is the hope for them to forever change that. And hence, I want to mention, since we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, um, that's why we hear the lies about Xinjiang. Because you, you, why all of a sudden, a few years ago, people in the West who have never met any Uyghurs, who have never heard about the word Uyghur, suddenly talk about Xinjiang, talk about Uyghurs' rights. There's a reason. Because Xinjiang is the gateway of the Belt and Road Initiative. If you look at the map, Xinjiang located in the northwest of China. It shares borders with eight countries. These eight countries are uh, Mongolia, Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. This region itself connects borders with eight countries. And you look, take a look at these countries, you know it's in Central Asia. So it also a crew region that many railways connecting Eurasia went through. Many railways starts from Xi'an in Central China, goes through Xinjiang, and then connect with entire Central Asia, West Asia, and Europe. So it's the gateway for Belt and Road Initiative to expand westward. If it worked, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative worked in this region, it will connect whole Eurasia. It will bring peace and stability to Eurasia. You know, this region has been seen as a geopolitical chessboard for major powers in the past decades. Big powers came here for their geopolitical gains and brought forever chaos and uh, wars and instabilities to this region. But if this region is connected through economic development, through the Narona Initiative, it would destroy the major powers geopolitical game. And it actually beneficial to the people living in this region. So that's why all the lies about Xinjiang were created. But you know, the lies, I'm happy to see the lies are falling apart. It doesn't work anymore. 
Um, first is because they they never cared about Muslim people's rights except Muslim people in China's rights. They don't care about people in Palestine's rights. They don't care about people in Gaza's rights. As uh, uh, I feel the whole world is seeing their hypocrisy. And second, despite all the lies that the Western media, Western government has been spreading, no Arab nations, no Muslim nations believe in this narrative. Uh, Islamic leaders from around the world, different uh, leaders of uh, Arab nations have came to Xinjiang to see for themselves. And they all praised China's anti-terrorism method. It, it's... When you see, it's so funny when you see Western countries are crying out loud for Muslim people in China, but Muslim leaders are saying, oh, China's anti-terrorism method is so great. Uh, how did you do it? They want to learn that. And they, uh, they totally support what China is doing in Xinjiang. And there's definitely no genocide to, to, to the people or to the culture. And now Xinjiang has been turned into a pilot free trade zone means more international business corporations, cultural technology uh, corporations will take place in Xinjiang. So this region will definitely be a hub for international co cooperations for Central Asia, for West Asia, for Europe. And uh, I think about a road, if we all come together and, and uh, work towards it, probably this is a, give us a chance to develop and uh, rise up peacefully. Oh my God, it's like so, you know, just so beautiful, uh, the vision and how much you um, embody it yourself. I mean, the joy you have from, you know, what you're talking about, what you're experiencing and what you see. You know, one of the things that, I, that always shocks me is, um, when you talk about China, they're like, oh, it's a dictatorship and everyone in China just must be a robot listening to the leadership and not knowing how to think. And I say, you know, I think, why do you say that to a person in China directly? Like, what would, what would it be like to say that to someone? How do you take that? Like, when someone says something like that, I, I find it so insulting and racist. Um, yeah. You know, you you must be, uh, you've experienced all this kind of silliness that people are really even unconscious about what they're saying and what it means to the listener. If you could kind of share, what's that like to listen to some of that information um, that you get from people uh, in the US? I think when I was younger, when I hear people say that to my face, I was shocked and don't know how to fight back. Now they say to me, I will just laugh in their face. <laughs> Um, it's that there is very racist. I think I also had this experience um recently in the United States. Um, when some of the uh, American people telling me, uh, China benefit from the real uh, from the world trade. You became rich because uh you stole the IPs from us. I was like, that's very American centric thinking. If we forever poor and we are always underdeveloped you would say see those lazy uh awful uh, stupid people cannot develop themselves but if we succeed you would say oh because we made you succeed everything is about you why why can't it be because we work hard and we design good policies that we finally develop ourselves and uh, so, and when you say we stole the technology IPs from you, now China even have the technology the Americans don't have. How can we steal things that you don't even have? <laughs> Do we steal the space uh, stations? Do we steal the 5G? Do we steal all the like from you? So that's condescending, but also uh, it's sad in a way because those people live in their own bubbles, like frogs in a well. You still think you are the greatest uh, umpire in the world. You don't need to look at the world. You know, that reminds me of the Qing Dynasty of China. That reminds me of the history during Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty of China. Uh, at the ending stage, um, when the United Kingdom, the West went through industrial revolution, got greater technologies, uh, really developed back then, but the empires 
then still think we are the greatest empire in the world. We, we don't need to learn from them. We're still great. So when you're trapped in that <laughs> well, in living, look what happened to China, and uh, the, that dynasty. It collapsed and China went through war for decades. And I think China learned from that experience. And China knows you can not, never isolate yourself from the rest of the world. You have always need to learn from each from other people. Whatever they're doing great, whatever works for you, bring br bring it to you, learn from them, uh, make it a part of your culture. Um, just develop, always study and work hard and develop. So um, I, I feel maybe this sounds disrespectful to, to a lot of people in America, but I do feel they need to look at the rest of the world. Look at what's going on in the world. Don't just focus on the United States because I'm sure Chinese people are not doing that. Chinese people are looking at the world and the rest of the world are also doing that. When I go to the Africa, when I go to uh, West Asia, go to Southeast Asia, you will see people know much about the rest of the world. They learn different languages. Uh, I can share with you the, some observations about the young people I feel about like in China, because in the past few months I've traveled to different top universities in China, like Beijing Renmin University, Peking University, Tsinghua University, Fudan University. And those young students in China give me so much hope about the future of China. For example, many of them are multilingual not just speaking Mandarin and English. Many of them speak perfect Arabic, perfect Spanish, perfect French. Um, some of them only 18, 19, but already doing different um, international communication exchange programs, uh, go to the UK, go to different parts of the world to learn from different cultures. Um, some of the students, I, I was told by my Iraqi friend who was giving lectures at universities in China, he said that those students, not only do they speak perfect Arabic, they also understand the world of politics. And uh, this student who speaks great Arabic also telling him, I'm not just learning Arabic, I'm also learning Swahili because I'm going to Africa. I mean, look at the worldview of this young generations. And another thing is, it's very hilarious recently because a few months ago, there's a viral video when oh, very viral on China's internet is a professor, middle-aged professor, go to a high school, uh, giving Chinese high school students a lecture. But his his speech was just, um, it's just 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 crazy. He was telling the students, "You just need to work hard and make more money, and uh, make more money, and then go to America and then marry white people, so uh, and then upgrade your genes, something like that." Horrible speech. And then, you know, it was at a high school or middle school and the entire crowd was like, what? But the audiences are teenagers. But one teenager stood out from the crowd, walked to the stage, uh, grabbed the microphone from the professor and telling all the audiences who are also teenagers, Chinese teenagers, like my fellow uh, classmates don't listen to this crappy professor. Why are we learning? We, where are we studying? We are studying for the rejuvenation of a Chinese nation. And he got the applaud from entire audiences, from teenagers. Imagine a 16 or 17 year old Chinese teenager woke up to the stage, calling the professor out and telling his classmates, we are studying for the rejuvenation of a Chinese nation. That's the spirit on man's side of the young generations in China. So I have so much hope for the young generations. I mean, they represent the future. So I really like think the future of this country is very promising. <laughs> well, we also have hope with, for the young people because right now they're in the streets for Palestine. Um, yeah. It's definitely an age difference. So I, I do look to the young people of the world to bring us to peace. 
So oh, one- by the way, I also want to give credit to the American youth. Even though I said something may, may sound disrespectful, but you know, it's understandable they they don't know much about China yet because there's no way for them to get information. There's no media doing uh, any stories about China. There's limitations on China. So I understand why they don't know so much about China or the rest of the world. But I find what's amazing is those American youth are so open-minded, so open-minded um, and open-minded to diverse cultures. And they are very respectful to me. And uh, when I tell them I'm from China, I'll let they, they sh- they are welcome. And I, th- I don't know much about your culture, but I think your culture is really beautiful. I heard your culture is very beautiful. So they are very open-minded. And I do met a group of students, high school students. They are super excited about going to China. It's the Lincoln High School in Washington State. I forgot which city, Lincoln High School. Those teenagers... They are super excited and uh, they want to come to China. They want to study and travel to China. They cannot wait. They are super, ex- the excitement is like, it's, it's incredible. And they're super friendly. So, and you know why they're so, so passionate about Chinese culture and coming to China? It's because um, many years ago, Chinese president Xi Jinping and Madame Peng Liyuan visited a school. So, and they have people to people interactions. Those students in that school met Chinese people, have good experience, uh, made friends with Chinese people. So there's no prejudice. There's no stereotypes. They're excited about coming to China. So maybe that's the thing we need to do. Just let people meet, make friends, right? So <laughs> that will be a start of a better relationship. So one of the things that always happens when I say I'm going to China and everybody, like, you know, be safe is um, what they say. And um, I've been in China with many uh, women from around the world. And what every single one of them has told me, I mean, not, I mean, every single one of them has said, I have never felt so safe in my life. Mm-hmm. No, because it's like the water you swim in. You don't understand the difference um, because it's just where you live. But um, you know, women from Africa, from Latin America, they've they've had a profound experience because also they didn't know the difference from where they lived, but they were just like, all of a sudden they realized I didn't realize how much energy I had in, to put into each day, feeling safe and making sure I was doing the right thing and making myself safe. So I'm wondering if you experienced anything in your coming to the United States that would help you understand how those people felt or if you're conscious of uh, what um, a safe place it, it, it is um, to be in. And um, I felt it in a different way. Um, I was there at some of the early days um, right after October 7th. And here I was watching hell on earth happen. And yet I was in a place where <clears throat> it just felt like peace and harmony. Mm-hmm. So how do you see it? Um, me and my friends always joke about when you're leaving China for too long, it lowers your guard of, of like I mean, safety because we got used to the safety that we have. Uh, for me as a woman living in a city like Beijing, I can walk alone on the street anytime I want. 12 p.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I don't need to worry about a thing. Uh, that's the safety you can get in most cities in China. Seriously. And uh, and uh, in many places, for example, if I go to a meeting, go to an event, I leave my bags, my laptops, my cell phone on the table, unattended, and go to talk to other people and come back, my stuff will still be there. I don't need to worry about being stolen. And uh, my other friends said the same thing because uh, recently they went to another country for a meeting and he got used to just leave his laptop and his backpack on the seat, on the on the seat and unattended. And, and the local people had to tell him, you're not in China, grab your stuff with you all the time. So, I mean, so like we, and the, 
nowadays, you know, because um, I haven't traveled abroad for like past uh, two years. And this year I went to different countries. Everywhere I go, I was warned again and again by local people or by uh, people from, from China, like, uh, be careful with your stuff. Don't go out at night. Uh, don't do this. Don't walk alone. Don't do that. Don't do that. A lot of warnings. I was like, really? In San Francisco, it's well. After seeing what, what like what's happening on the streets in the area where I live, I don't dare to walk out of the door. So, um, this this it, it's like how when many Western countries talk about human rights, talk about freedom. I find it hilarious. You don't even have the freedom of safety. You don't even have the human rights of just safety or just even just, how about your, you don't even have a clean city. I mean, isn't that human rights as well? You don't have a safe and a clean city. Like where's the freedom? Where's the human rights of that? Yet in the, uh, developing nation in the the uh like very backward of China, you can have all the freedom. So it's it's, and also I think I talked talked to KJ about this as well. I <laughs> mean because this year, uh, we have many friends from different parts of the world, like from New York, from San Francisco, from London, from around the world coming to China, to, to Beijing. I asked them their impressions about Beijing. How do you feel? And the word they gave me are also just, just very simple words. Oh, Beijing is so clean. It shocked me. Uh, I think clean is the basic, is a very basic thing for a city to do. But so many people came to Beijing and said, oh, Beijing is so clean. And uh, how come there's no homelessness in Beijing, in China? It's like, how come you still have homeless people you, when you are the number one country in the world. So, I mean, there's so much culture shock, but, uh, well, I think if, if but you know, I, it's not just China. Many Asian countries are the same. If you go to Japan, if you go to South Korea, if you go to Singapore, you will also feel the s same level of safety and also cleanness. Cities in Japan are also very clean. Cities in Singapore are very clean. In general Asia, I feel you will have the same level of safety and cleanliness. And I think that's something that Western civilizations need to think about. How come you cannot have the basic things when you look down upon Asia? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to let you go, even though I'd love to spend another hour <laughs> with you. Thank you, Jingjing, for sharing your heart. And um, you know, if you want to continue the conversation with her, she's got an amazing uh, channel that you can watch. She's going to take you around China. She'll take you around the world. You can follow her on YouTube at Jingjing underscore Lee or on Twitter. And um, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for sharing your heart and being so authentic. And um, you, you don't look like an oppressed person to me or talk like one. <laughs> <laughs> even though we, we you know that's what we hear in the united states um so thank you for all you do thank you for building bridges for peace and love and connectivity that's what we need in the world today and you are brilliant at it with your open heart and your your brilliance at being able to see and share deepest gratitude Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody, for having me on. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I would love to talk to all of you for if if, if I, we have more time or if we have more chances, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I really think it's just we need to um, step out of our own comfort zone, step out of our own bubbles, and uh, just to meet each other, talk to each other, to talk to each other and visit each other's country and learn each other because when you actually just like i mentioned earlier when you actually meet the person that you didn't know before when you actually went to the country that you didn't know before all the stereotypes all the, uh, all the stereotypes you had just just collapse and uh the during the COVID years when most people cannot come to china the media 
abuse that opportunity to spread all kinds of lies. But all these lies are collapsing because people all come to China and see for themselves, it doesn't work anywhere. So just like I said in my video, when you come here, see for yourself, have people to build interactions, all the narratives, the media spreading won't be working. So let's be friends. Let's make friends and come to China. I will be here welcoming me, all of you. And I want to go to the United States again <laughs> and again to help more people, build more people to build connections. <laughs> so thanks for talking it out with us, Jing Jing. <laughs> See you soon. All right. Much love and peace. Peace. Thank you.